This evening, uh, we're starting these sessions with Pasha's Beratius, and I would like, first of all, to thank uh, my good friend, Benjamin Sofer, for asking me to do this and participating in it, and uh, for arranging the technical side of it as well. Beratius, there are three foundations to our Amuna. One is that we believe in the existence of God. That's the first foundation. We also believe in creation, the way it's explained in the Chumash, that God created the world in seven days. On the seventh day, he rested. And um, this is a very important uh, uh, fundamental tenet of Judaism. The other foundation of our um, Baramuna is Torah Mena Shemayim. We believe that the Torah, the Rebbein Shleilam, gave the Torah to Moshe Rabbeinu, and he brought it down to us, and everything is in it. It's true. The Torah is of divine origin. Torah Mena Shemayim is a topic, a very, very important topic, and there's a lot to be said about it, and that is something we will discuss in Mirz Hashem, when we get to Sefer Shemais. Now we're the, starting with Bereshis, so we'll talk about the existence of the Rebbein Shleilam and Bria Shleilam. So, we have our world. We have a world. Where did the world come from? So really, there are two possibilities. One possibility is that it was created. If it was created, that means there was no world before. There was nothing. It's called Ex Nihilo. It was created out of nothing. Yesh Me'ayin. So, if it was created Yesh Me'ayin, then there's a creator. It didn't create itself. There had to be a creator. Then there is a God. What's the other option? That the world was always there. Scientists will say that the world was always there, although that position is called naturalism. That means that only what you can see with your senses can be true, can exist. Anything you don't see with your senses doesn't exist. That is not a scientific position. That is a philosophical position. Science cannot prove or disprove the existence of God. Science deals with nature, with the world as we see it. But there is such a, a school of thought called naturalism that the world was always there. So we have to consider both sides. So a number of years ago, decades ago, the scientists discovered by measuring the Doppler effect that the, that the universe was expanding. So if the universe was expanding, that means it's expanding, that means if you track that back, it comes to a point. And that point is called the Big Bang. That was called the Big Bang. So that, that was a problem. That was a problem. If there was a Big Bang, then th that's the beginning of the world. So first of all, I'd like to say that the Big Bang, actually, the Ramban, I, I just made copies. I shouldn't have to have many different things. The, the Ramban actually says this, the Big Bang. Avil hoitzi mina efes agomer, the Ban Shalom extracted from absolute nothing, hamuchlet, yisoid dak ma'oid, a very tiny fundamental element. And by mamish, it has no substance. Avil hukoyach mamzi, it has the ability to create, muchel lekabel atzura, lotzeis mina koyach alapoyel, that from this little, little dot, which had no no uh, substance, everything developed from there. The only thing the Ramban says that was created, Bora, is only this dot. Everything else is called Yotzar. He formed it. Everything started with this dot, which is the Big Bang. This dot has no substance. It's not matter. It's energy. It's a dot of energy with a, an astronomically high temperature, tremendous amount of energy in the one dot, and when this dot exploded, then spread out, a lot of this energy turned into matter, and this is how we got the stars and the planets. That all came from this one dot, which uh, the Ramban calls Koyach Hiyuli, 
That means that it's a Greek word, which means the force of energy. It has to do with the sun, but really, Ramban is using it as energy. So, apparently, the world had a beginning. But no. Stephen Hawking, I read Stephen Hawking's probably says other places. He said that there was a cycle, that after the world expands, 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 and it runs out of gas, then it starts to contract, 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 until it comes back to that same little dot. First, you start with a big bang, and you end up with a big crunch. And the big crunch brings everything back into that Koyach Yuli, and then the cycle starts again. And this cycle goes on endlessly. Big bang, big crunch, big bang, big crunch, big uh, crunch, and this has been going on forever. The Oilam Kadmoin is called. The world always existed. Okay, so this is what they say. So let's examine the two sides. This is what their position is. Our position is creation. Let's examine the two sides. So, originally, there was something called the argument from design. That means that if you find uh, two pebbles on the floor, so you say, maybe they just happen to be together. If you find three, maybe. If you find a little mound of pebbles, that already seems to indicate that somebody did that. But what if you find a watch? It's called the watch in the the watchmaker in the desert. If you find a watch in the desert, you assume that there was a watchmaker. If there's a watch, you assume there's a watchmaker. So, was this conclusive? No, because if if there are forces in nature that develop, so maybe maybe it develops like that. If there's life, maybe uh, a watch has no life; it can grow of its own. Something which has life, maybe it could develop from a cell to uh, to something else, to a monkey, to a horse. So there's an answer to that. But in the last like 20 years or so, there's a school of thought called intelligent design, which means there are many people work on this. Um, they they find they 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 write about how complex the world is that it cannot have happened by itself. Um, If you say that life started with a a unicellular animal, but if you go into uh, microbiology, then you find that a unicellular animal is not simple. It's extremely complex. It's more complex than a space shuttle. So where is this simple... So they say that... It's true that the um, that the odds of something like this happening is trillions to one, which would seem, you know, negligible. But they say even if it's trillions to one, there are so many trillions of stars in the universe that maybe we are the one. The one out of a trillion is here. So the terrors for everything. But as far as we're concerned, it really is a very good argument in Quinta Rambam that he says that metaphysical questions cannot be proven scientifically. Metaphysical uh, questions, um, you can't experiment on, on metaphysical meaning things which are beyond nature. So you, so you can't be proven scientifically. You can't have uh, um, you know, experiments to figure that out. So you have to go by the most reasonable, most the the most reasonable assumption. For instance, if you have you get on a plane, so how do you know that um, the pilot has a license? How do you know he went to flight school? How do you know? So you assume that it's a, it's a fair assumption. So really, we should go by fair assumptions. So really, intelligent design. Many Sfarim bring it down. The idea that the complexity of the world is um, a very powerful proof, although not conclusive, but it's very powerful proof that there was a creator, that there is a designer. I would like to start a little at the other side. Instead of trying to prove that, um, that the world had a creator, there's another option. The other option is that the world was always there. So I would like to 
tried to refute that side with a mathematical proof. Um, what is infinity? Is infinity a number? It's not a number, because if infinity was a, a tremendously large number, then you could write infinity plus one, and you end up with a number that's higher than infinity. Infinity is not a number. Infinity is a concept, an abstract concept. One divided by zero is infinity. I think everybody knows that. Why? Does that mean that one is full of gazillions and gazillions of zero? It's packed in tight with zeros? That's not what it means. It means that if you keep adding zeros and keep adding zeros, then you'll never get to one. So that makes it infinity. But infinity is not a number. Now, the Rambam in the Mar Nevochem, in the Hagdoma to the second Chalik, brings 26 propositions from Aristotle. And uh, he agrees with the first 25, and he disagrees with the 26, which we won't get into now. But the first proposition is that there cannot be an infinite number of finite objects. And it makes sense. Things which are finite don't exist in an abstraction. If you have a number, if you have a series of finite objects, if you had the time and the patience and the inclination to count them, you could count one, two, three, and it's not infinity. And I'll prove it. Like um, Hawking, the same book, A Brief History of Time, quotes Isaac Newton. He says, how come the world doesn't implode because of gravity? So he says, because there are an infinite number of stars. Well, I, there's no such thing as an infinite number of stars, because an infinite number of stars would be a ser an infinite series of finite objects that cannot be. And I'll prove it. Because let's say you had an infinite, if you could have an infinite number of stars, you could also have an infinite number of cows. And one of the cows would give birth, you would have a number higher than infinity. So there's no such thing as an infinite number of finite objects. There's no such thing. Now, when we talk about space, Space is, if you fly from the Earth to the Moon, 250,000 miles, that you're flying through a series of cubic feet, let's say, of space. Those are finite objects. A cubic foot of space, empty space, is a finite object. You're going from one to the next to the next to the next. So therefore, you cannot have an infinite series of space. Space cannot go on for infinity, because space is like a star, like it's, it's something which is finite. It's bound by, by whatever the measurement is, a cubic foot, a cubic meter, whatever it is, it is bound, so it's a finite object. It's just empty. It's like a box. And you have all these boxes, one after another, leading you to the moon. They cannot go on forever. Space cannot go on forever. And this, uh, space is a, is a creation. At the same well, at the same time, time. Time is also a series of finite units. You have uh, a minute, let's say, then you have, or we'll call it an hour, then you have two hours, three hours, four hours, five hours. This is a series of finite units. Yeah. So anything that's measurable. Anything that's measurable, is right? Finite. Right. Anything that has boundaries. Finite means it has ends, it has boundaries. Time has, can be measured, it has boundaries. From now, to an hour from now, that is the boundary. So it is a finite object time. So you cannot have an infinite number of hours. You can't have that. Now, if you say that the world always existed, that means you're saying the world existed in infinite time. There is no such thing as infinite time. Time going forward can be infinite because new time is being created all the time and there's no limit to how much new time could be created. You can just keep creating more and more. So therefore, time going forward can be infinite. But time going back, no new time is being created in the past. Whatever the past is, it was. So you're saying that, it's going, that it exists in infinite time. There's no such thing as infinite time. Time cannot be infinite. So, on the one hand, we have 
the intelligent design, which very strongly supports the idea of creation and design. On the other hand, you have, I think, a mathematical proof. Maybe somebody will dispute it somehow, but again, we have, it's a, it's a, a reasonable assumption that there is no such thing as infinite time going back. So it cannot be. Okay. So now, so I think we've established that it's reasonable to believe that the Rabban Shalom exists. In fact, I think it's, it's, it's actually innate. The person naturally believes that, that the Rabban Shalom exists. Um, when the Chavis Lavavis wants to prove that Yichud, Yichud means the unity of God, which is a difficult concept to understand it. But that's, Kunit HaChavis Lavavis, Yichud is the portal to Judaism. When you believe in Yichud, that's the portal of Judaism. So in order to prove it, he says, we have to go back to prove that God exists. But without proving Yichud, you don't have to prove God exists because everybody, in, it's innate, everybody automatically believes that God exists. But if you want to give a philosophical proof for, for the unity of God, then you have to build a foundation of a philosophical proof for the existence of God. But anyway, I think that it's pretty clear that the most reasonable assumption is that God exists. Now the question is, why did he create the world? Why? So everyone knows what the Ramchal says, that he, want, wrote that he wanted to be native to Briyosov, but, but that is, you know, if you take that simplistically, it really is difficult. It's like it's like like he had want. The word want comes from a void. If you don't not missing anything, you don't want anything. You only want because there's something you're lacking. Whatever the reason you're lacking, maybe maybe you need a very fancy car and you feel a lack of the fancy car, then you want it. If you don't feel the lack of the fancy car, then you don't want it. So to say that. God wanted to create the world because he wanted it to do good. It seems that he had a void and he wanted to uh, he wanted to fill that void. That cannot be said. God does not have any voids. It's almost like he was frustrated. He couldn't... So I spoke to people that are really experts in the Ramchal. And the Ramchal is really very Kabbalistic. And they explained to me that there is a very deep philosoph- the, the Kabbalistic explanation for that. And it's not meant to be taken as a simplistic thing, just say, you know, God wanted to do good. It's, it, I mean, I'll tell you the truth, he was explaining it to me, and he lost me, which I accept, you know. I didn't, I didn't understand. The theory is Nama de Kisufa? Nama de Kisufa, I don't know. I can't go there. I don't understand that Amchal is holy, and what he said, I'm sure, is... Is I mean, many people disagreed with him when he said that, but I'm sure that it's a very legitimate point point of view, and I know that I don't understand it, and maybe someday, you know, I, I'm not, I, I don't know Kabbalah, I'm, I don't know, but and and uh, you know, Regalacha, somebody's complained to me this whole thing with the with the spheres and the kasorim, I just like didn't get it, but I'd like to go on a more rational approach. The Rambam writes. In, in the fifth peric of Shemayinah Prokim, and all the way through many times through the Moira, through the, the guide, that the Iker is Yediyah Hashem. You have to recognize God. You have to recognize Him. And he says, you should, everything that you do, just everything should be about coming to recognize God. Now, why, why is this such an Iker? And it would seem that this is somehow has to do with the purpose of creation. If if that's what he wants, Yidiyas Hashem, that's what he wants. The idea of of uh, the idea of Mashiach. What's the idea of Mashiach? That Hashem wants that we should recognize him. When Mashiach comes, be that the whole world will be Deya Hashem. The whole world would have Yidiyas Hashem. 
So there are two ways you could reach that. You could reach it as Bechira. Hashem gave us the intellect and the free will to search for him and find him and recognize him. And he also, if, if we fail, then Mashiach will come and we will recognize him by having it placed in front of our face. But um, right now, we're like, where are we? You know, the Gemara says, either Kula Chayev or Kula Potter. If everybody, Kula is If everyone is Zakai, that means everyone recognizes Hashem, then Mashiach will come because that's the fulfillment of what he wanted. If nobody recognizes him, then it's failure, you know, it's not it's not gonna work. So he has to show you. But what is the idea of Idias Hashem? So I think the key is in a, a Tanchuma. The Gemara says in Brachas, Aftes, that ain't Surkalakenu, ain't Sayer Kalakenu. There is no artist like God. And the Tanchuma adds a number of things, but I want to focus on one of the things he focuses, that he says, how a, a human painter differs from Hashem. So he says that when a human painter makes a painting, he stands and praises the painting. Rembrandt makes a painting, he stands there, he looks at it and says, I think I did a pretty good job. Look at my brushwork, my use of color, my use of light. It's pretty good. But the painting is lifeless. The painting doesn't say anything. Whereas when the Rebbein makes a painting, the painting praises him. That When we recognize Hashem, we are praising him. So this, that the painting praises him, is beyond, beyond, it's a, it's a, it's a, the whole universe is a masterpiece. Unbelievable. The, the, the mountains and the valleys and the rivers, the galaxies, the planets, it's just unbelievable. But what is the crowning touch of this masterpiece is Hashem made uh, about, you know people who have intellect and are able to recognize Him of their own free will. That is beyond. That is the idea of creation. The Rabbani Shalom is an artist and this is what he created. And he wants the thing to have 100% success. If we recognize him, then the, then the artistic enterprise is 100% successful. If we don't recognize him, it's a failure. But I mean, a partial failure is still, you know. But, but it's not his failure because he gave us the Bechira. So it's our failure. But, but it's not what it should be. It's not 100% of, the, of what he wanted. He wanted that we should recognize him and fulfill the, the, the artistic vision of creating the world. And we should, the painting should recognize the painter. That's what he wanted. And the painting means, means everything that happens in the world. It's, it's an active painting. It's not just the, 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 the tableau, the background. Every volcano that erupts is part of the painting. Every mother that goes to her child in the middle of the night to the crying child to soothe that child, that's part of the painting. Every person that does a mitzvah is part of the painting. We are all details in this, in this fantastic painting that the Rabbani Shalom made. That is what we are. So why does the musician play? Why? Does he have a void? Does he have, like, he, he needs money? He needs fame? A true artist, a true artist will, is creative. His art is the expression of his creativity. There's no question why he does it. He does it because Hashem is called the creator, not because he created the world. He created the world because he's the creator. And who knows what he created? You think this is his only work? Who knows how many universes he created? Who knows how many fantastic creations he made? We have no idea. We just see our universe, and it's incredibly fantastic. But we don't know what else he did. The Ban Shalom is a creator, and the creator creates. Um, there are certain... The Rambam will speak about Ratzon and Chachma. He uses two separate things. 
Hashem's will and His wisdom. And in Kabbalah, you know, you know, I was told that the highest level is Ratzon. Kesser is Ratzon. Chachma comes below Ratzon. So how do we understand this? What is Ratzon? If God's will is rational, then that's Chachma. How is it? It's wisdom. If it's irrational, how could you say that God has irrational wills? You can't say that. So how do we differentiate Ratzon from Chachma? So I think that Ratzon is the aesthetic will. Because at the source of everything, Hashem wanted to create a world. That is the tsayar making a painting, the painter making a painting. That's what it's at. If you ask a painter, why is there a little streak of orange over there? Why? There is no formula that he could give you that will explain why that would be a streak of orange instead of a streak of yellow. No, there's no, no formula. But why? Because that is the way he wanted it. That was his vision. So when the Rabban Shalom created the world, this is how he made it? This is his vision. We can't ask. The Rama says all the time, you can ask, um, why does the king need a throne? He should sit on it. Why does he have sin? It should be higher than the people. Always, you can always go back and back and back. When you talk about Hashem at the end, you always come to Ratzon, because that was his will. What does that mean, I think? I think it means that that was his artistic vision. He is the painter. He's making a painting. That is his artistic vision. You cannot ask why. You cannot ask. Anything that happens in the world that you cannot explain, it's the Ratzon Hashem. Should people uh, you know, be successful? Should they fail? Should they be this? Should they be that? Whatever happens in the world, you know, whether Hashem actually, you know, designed that it should happen, or, because Hashem knows everything, He knows everything that's in the world. He has complete knowledge. Who are Yedeya, who are who are Das? He knows everything. So He's aware of everything. So anything that happens in the world, the Rambam believes that there is randomness in the world, there's chance. You know, a deer running in the forest and a tree falls and kills the deer, it's not likely that, that uh, God decided he wants to kill the deer. What did the poor deer do? But the deer was running. He was the wrong place at the wrong time. The tree was falling at that time, so it hit him, and it killed him. However, so that's, it's not a direct Ashgacha protest. However, God knew that that tree is going to hit that deer. And if he decided not to intervene, then that was his rotson. It wasn't his rotson to create that scene, but once he knows that that scene is going to happen, and he says, well, I'm not going to intervene, that is an indirect Ashgacha protest, but it's also Ashgacha protest. Hashem, that is the Ratzon of Hashem that should happen. Not that Lachachili said so, but if that's what's happening, he doesn't want to intervene. Whatever the reason is, he doesn't want to intervene. We can't ask. So, there seems to be a... Um what you're saying is that there's a Hashem made a, um, a set laws of nature or yes. metaphysical or physical and they're running its course sometimes. The Rambam believes that, that there is nature. Some people believe that there is no nature and every every second is a new creation. That's, uh, you know, not, not uh, some people believe that. The Rambam says that that comes from Muslim theologians, but uh, not, not the Muhammad or the Quran. I mean, they work on on the philosophy of understanding Achtu Sabayre. So that's what some people believe. The Rambam is adamantly against that. He says there is nature. He made Chukah Teva. He made the laws of nature. If there's no laws of nature, if everything, then then you're really diminishing the the beauty of what Hashem did, because every law of nature, every law of nature is a, is is an artistic creation. That that there's gravity. That the wind blows that the, everything is, is a law of nature. So the Rambam believes very strongly in the laws of nature. And he believes that, that people can fall victim to the vicissitudes of nature. But again, as I'm, I mean, he doesn't really spell this out, but that doesn't mean that it happens without his knowledge and doesn't mean that it happened against his will. If it happened, he allowed it to happen, and that is a kind of Ashgachah protest. Now, 
is a mitzvah to love Hashem. If you have a, a primitive idea of Hashem, you have a primitive idea of God, you think that Hashem is a Zaydi in heaven, you create an image in your mind, a Zaydi in heaven with a long white beard, and when you do uh, an Avera, he sheds a tear, and when you do good things, he claps his hands in joy. That is Avedah Zara. That is not, that is not Hashem. It's not Him. Rambam says, if you create a false notion, then it's not Him. It's not, it's not that you have a mistaken idea about Him. It's not Him. If you say an elephant has three legs and it flies and it talks like a person, it's not an elephant. So any, anything like that, it's a mistake. If you're a little bit more sophisticated, which I think most people are, they understand that Hashem is the infinite. He is the infinite from which the finite world arose. He is the infinite. How do you love Hashem? How do you love Him? How can I love something which is beyond my, my scope? I cannot even begin to understand what Hashem is. You cannot have any idea of what Hashem is. The Rambam says the only thing you could know is what he's not. But when you say that he has wisdom, you have no idea what that means. You could just say that he's not ignorant. Negative attributes, he calls it. But you have a sag of, how do you, Hashem is the Ein Saif, he's the infinite. How do you love the infinite? How do you direct your love to the infinite? How? So the Rambam asked this question in uh, the second paragraph of Yisrael Da Torah, I think Allah Beis, he says, "If Eza Derech Lavas Hashem," he says that you're misbeinen in the world that he created, and miyad ayavai. Immediately you love him. And say for a mitzvah, I think the third or fourth, third mitzvah, the mitzvah of Avas Hashem. He says the same thing, and he says, "Behechrech ayavai." It's a hechrech. It must be. There is no other way. You love Hashem. I would think that if you look at the world that he created, you'd be full of admiration, you'd be full of awe, but how do you get to love? Where does love come from? So I think the pshat is like this, as we were speaking before, that can you give a gift to Hashem? Can you give him anything? Hashem has everything. Can you give him anything? The truth is that you can't. You can give him a gift. What's the gift you can give him? The success of his artistic enterprise. If you look at the world and you recognize that this is the tzayur and this is the painting, you recognize Hashem, you recognize God, if you do that, then you are giving him the success of his enterprise, of his art, and if you wouldn't give it to him, he wouldn't have it. This is something because he left it up to us and we have a choice. So if we Look at it, not just saying look at it, but if we look at it with an understanding that this is what Hashem wants us to see, He wants us to recognize Him as the painter, and we are the painting, and He wants us to recognize Him as a painter. If you look at it in that mind, then you realize that you are giving Him an incredible, incredible gift. You are giving Him the success of the Bria, which He would not have without you. And we know that people are wired that the ones to whom they give, they love. That's the way people are wired. So if we give to Hashem without understanding anything, but if we give Him such a fantastic gift, then automatically, behechrech, miyad, we will love Him. Because we're giving to Him. We're giving to Him something that He does not have. That's Avas Hashem. So the whole idea is Hashem made the world because he is a painter. And why did he do this? Because that was his rotson. He's creative and he wanted to do this. He wanted to make galaxies that are a hundred million light years away. What does that have to do with us? It's not going to help us do tshuva. He wanted to. He wanted to do all of this. That was his rotson. That was his rotson as the tsayar, which is the highest level of, of the sphere is the highest level. Rotzen. Now, I want to address something else. We know we have a big problem with the age of the universe. That scientists measure the, the universe and they measure, they, they, they 
with, the, with geological clocks, uh, uranium lead or lithium, some other element, and the isotopes when they break down, so you could measure how long it is. And they've discovered that there were, the Grand Canyon is like three billion years old. Certain things. And another thing they've discovered, so we can't deny this, we can't deny this, the Rambam is very busy, he says, science is science, we can't deny it, but we have to understand it. I recently read that there was an expedition a geological expedition to Antarctica. A whole team of scientists went to Antarctica, and they were not there with an agenda to undermine Orthodox Judaism. They were scientists that were going to do their job. They they had digs in Antarctica, and they found fossils of trees, and they found fossils of dinosaurs in Antarctica, which indicates that at one time Antarctica was a lush green land, and that there were dinosaurs, and there were all kinds of, of other, what we call prehistoric animals. They were there, and we found the fossils. So how do we explain this? So, I want to explain with the Rashi. It says at the end of, at the end of, of the Bria, oh, these so many pages, I wish I got, Shul uh, Chamesh. Okay, I'll say it by heart. Hashem finished his work on the seventh day. So Rashi asks, he didn't finish on the seventh day, he finished on the sixth day. Everything was done on the sixth day. Why do you say he finished on the seventh day? So the famous Rashi says, The world was only missing rest. Bo Shabbos, Bo Menucha. On Shabbos, there were rest. So everybody talks about this. What does that mean? Bo Shabbos, Bo Menucha. Menucha is a negative. It's a shlili. It's not something that you make. It's the absence of work. It's not, it's not something positive that was created on Shabbos. So what does this mean? So I think the Pshat Narashi is that the Gemara says, it's in Hedrin, that in the eighth day, eighth hour of the sixth day, the other Mechava were there, Shnaim Ol Mito Varbo Yordu. Two people, two adults went into the bed, and four came down. There's a question of what the other two was a kind in Hevel, was a kind and his twin, maybe that was later, but two people went into bed, and four adults came down. How do four adults come down? I mean, how does a woman give birth to an adult? I mean, it just can't be. So what is the Gemara saying? Gemara is saying that everything that happened during creation, if you see a, um, a bud, and you see a film of bud, and you see, you see it open up, open up, yeah? and you have a flower opened up, and you see it takes like a few seconds. But really, it could take a week, it could take two weeks, and it's, it's a fast forward. It's a, spe- it's a you speed up the, to the thing, so you see it go like that, even though it takes longer. During the Sheshit's Mebreshit, the world was in manufacturing mode. Shem was creating the world, and he was creating it at hyper speed. Hyper speed, something that would take a tree, that would take, let's say, 25 years to grow, maybe it grew in five minutes. I don't know what the speeds were, I don't know if there was a uniform speed for everything, maybe different things at different speeds, but everything was going at hyper speed. Everything was very, very, very quick. And on Shabbos, we, the world went down to normal speed. Menucha. Menucha means normal speed. If you would be standing there, don't chase my brace and watching it, you you get dizzy. Everything is dizzy. I mean, you'd be dizzy. But Shabbos, Everything was normal the way it is now. It was a chiddush. It was something new. Bo Shabbos Bo Menucha, the speed of, of nature, the way we know it, was introduced on Shabbos. Bo Shabbos Bo Menucha. So everything that you see, all the geological clocks, it's all based on uniformitarianism, it's called. That everything in nature was, 
opera was the same as it ever was. There's another school called catastrophism that uh, that there may have been catastrophic events that caused change, like um, like meteor striking. But uniformitarianism please, please that it's all the same. So if you're going by today's time, by today's speed, then you extract, you know, you project it backwards and you could have millions and billions of years. Now during that time, Medrash says that there's another um Kumara. Abishu of Malevi says, Call mass of Rashis, the Kemosin Nibru, the Data Nibru, the Sivyam Nibru. Everything in the Bria, everything in the Bria was created with its size, its capacity, and its properties fully developed. But that doesn't mean that presto changeo, like uh, Hashem opened the earth and he took out a tree. It means that the whole tree went through the entire process to maturity very, very, very quickly. And that's what that's what happened. So the the Medrash says, Mikan He created world and destroyed them. He decided this I want and this I don't want. So that means I believe that during Shesh Mebreshes, there were dinosaurs, there were hominids. There were the Andesol men. They were not. They didn't have neshamas. They weren't like I don't know uh, if they had intellect. They had a certain level of intelligence, maybe better than monkeys, but they didn't have intellect. They didn't have neshamas. They were just hominids, and he created the Neanderthal men and Cro-Magnon men and dinosaurs and mammoths and pterodactyls, and then he destroyed them. Why did he do that? Well, he created them because that was part of his his art. He created dinosaurs. Why did he create dinosaurs? It was his rotson. He wanted to. There's no question. Why was there an orange streak? As he wanted to. That was aesthetic vision. You can't ask a question. He decided he wants to make dinosaurs. But before human beings came along, he destroyed them. Maybe he didn't. Maybe he felt that they would eat up all the people. It would be too dangerous. I don't know. Maybe he just, you know, it was just a temporary thing. But you cannot ask a question on him why he created them, because the creation of a dinosaur was an artistic creation. Did he, did he, did he want it to live longer? Apparently not. So what does Eilomis mean? Antarctica was a lush land. Uh, there was an ice age. The world was maybe the axis changed. Whatever happened, whatever happened, we really can't know. I mean, we can know the things that the geologists find. We can see fossils. We know that they were dinosaurs. But they, they may have lasted, lasted a half a day. Maybe the entire Jurassic period lasted six hours. I don't know. But everything was at hyperspeed. Everything was going very quickly. There's a medrash that says that Avram Avinu recognized Rabbi Shlomo. He recognized. And the, the Medrash gives a marshal. A man is walking mimakam lemakam, and he sees a, a bira, he sees a palace ablaze with light. So he says, there must be a balabira, there must be somebody who owns this, who made this, there must be a, bala, bala, a balabira. So Hashem, he says, love, and he told him, aniya balabira. What did what did Avram see? What did he see? I mean, that it, that the beer is created. Everybody in the pagan world had a creation story. Everybody, nobody believed that the, that the beer grew up by itself or that the world came by itself. All kinds of nonsense stories. This god and that god, but everybody had a creation story. And Avram and Makam Lamaka means he was going from one town to another town. And he was out in the open fields, and it was dark. It was dark. They didn't have street lights. And it was dark. And he saw this, this bira. Why? Why couldn't he see that in, in the city? The city had dozens of biras, and all of them were ablaze with light. Take a look at all these biras. They didn't happen by themselves. Somebody made them. 
Why, why is the marshal that is going memakam lemakam through the dark countryside and he sees a bira? So I think what the Medrash is saying, that he recognized that the darkness is a metaphor for the infinite. He recognized that the finite world has to come from the infinite. Because the finite world could not have come by itself and it could not have always existed. There had to be an infinite foundation. That's what he saw. He saw the darkness all around, the infinite. I mean, the infinite is uh, just a metaphor for the infinite. But he saw the infinite and he saw the finite and he says, how could there be a bira in the infinite? There must be a creator. There must be a creator. That's what Avram, that's what he recognized. That's how he recognized Hashem. So now we have a question. If Hashem is the infinite, so how does the world exist? If the world exists, then we infringe on his infinity because, I mean, he's not here. So how, how does that work? So, um... So the Kabbalists say, the Kabbalists say, that there was something called Tzimtzum, that, that God, so to speak, contracted himself to make a place for the world. But, you know, as I told you before, I don't know Kabbalah, but something like this is, has to be. But what does that mean? What is Tzimtzum? If he contracted himself, then he's no longer infinite. Of course, he has boundaries. The boundaries are the world that he created. So how is he the infinite? Also, if he contracted himself, that means that he's like divided. He's not uni- there's no unity. So I think, there's not, there's another question. Sfarim ask. That you have a dichotomy, and so in Mchadish Betuve Bechol Yom Tomed, Hashem creates the world again and again every day. Yaitzer Oyer, He creates it in the present tense. He creates the world now. But on the other hand, you say, Asher Yotzer Es Adam Bechachma. He created in the past, and Chachma means the laws of nature. So does the world operate by the laws of nature, or is the world being recreated all the time? So some say that it's being recreated, and nature is only an illusion. Now, I go with the Rambam that, uh, you know, I'm saying who's right and who's wrong, but I follow the sheets of the Rambam that nature is not an illusion. Nature is real. So how do these two things work? So I think... I'll say it in one sentence, and then I'll explain it. I think the entire world exists in God's mind. It doesn't exist. It doesn't have an independent existence. It only exists in Rabban Shalom's mind. Baruch She'omar v'haya o'ilam. He didn't do anything. He just said. Nothing happened after he said. When he said, and he conceived the world, it existed. As soon as he conceived the world, it existed in his mind. So I want to talk about, about what's, what, what's real and what's not real. The question of reality is like, the first question in philosophy 101. How do we know we exist? How do we know we exist? So, the famous saying from uh, Descartes, that cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. So, let's say, so we know that we exist. Of course, we have consciousness, so we exist. But how about the world around us? How do we know the world around us exists? How do we know? Because we see it? Maybe it's not there. Maybe we just see it. So I want to give you an example. When we have a dream, we also see things, we also touch things, but we're not seeing, really seeing them, and not touching them, they're all imaginary. So let's, let me give you a hypothetical. Why is a dream different from reality? Because it has no coherence. It's it's disjointed. One day this, one day that. It doesn't it doesn't have continuity and coherence. So let's say somebody 
from the time that he was very young, had a dream every night, and it was a continuous dream. Every night he went to sleep, he picked up where he left off. He got up, he picked up where he left off in his waking hours. And this is like two different lives parallel. And let's say, hypothetically, that in this life that he has in his dream, he can learn new things and visit, you know, I mean, our dreams are, um, you know, we only rely on what we know, what was in, but let's say he could visit Mumbai and he could read new books and he could learn new language. Let's say he could do that. So you have two lives. One is in waking hours, one is in the sleeping hours. And they're different. They're different. He has a different wife, a different job, different children. Everything is different. A different house. Everything is different. And at the end of, it gets to be 40 years old. So he's told, listen, this cannot go on. You're living one life when you're awake and one life when you're asleep. You have to choose. And we give you three options. One option, you pick the waking life. The second option, you pick the sleeping life. The third option, you pick the better one. And I've done an informal survey, and I've asked many, many people this question, and almost all of them said they would pick the better one. Because if you're having reality's experience, what your experience is, that's your reality. So if during the day, yeah, you're fighting with your wife and your business is going bankrupt, and, this, and at night, you have a totally different life, and everything is going great and wonderful, then, and, and you're living it, so I'd rather live that life than this life. But is it not real? It is real, because you're experiencing it. What makes this more real than that? So if we, uh, we exist in Rebbe Shalom's mind, and we don't have an independent existence, separate from the Rabbani Shalom, it's still we are when we we exist, so we are experiencing the world. So that is reality. So it's something that it's maybe a little hard to wrap your mind around it, but that's reality. So when you have these two things of Yetzer Ayer or Asher Yotzer Bechachma, the Rabbani Shalom created a world. And that world doesn't have to exist out of him. It exists in his mind. The whole world exists in his mind. And it exists and it follows the laws of nature. So what does it mean that he does it new every day? Because since it exists in his mind, if for one moment he would stop thinking about it, it would cease to exist. So every single day, by keeping it in his mind, he's mechadish betuvah, b'chol yom tamed. He's keep he's keeping the world alive because he's keeping it in his mind. But how does the world operate? It operates from the past with the laws with the laws of nature. The Rambam says in in uh, you say that Torah. He says um, I think it's Perak Aleph. He says that if you could imagine that God stops existing the world would cease to exist. But if you could imagine that the world ceases existing, God continues to exist. The existence of the world is dependent on God. It's dependent on Him. It has no existence independent of God. There's a Rashi in Kahelis. Kahelis says, Havel Havolim Oma Kahelis, Havel Havolim, Hakoil Hevel. Now, usually it's translated as folly. Hevel means a folly. Folly of follies, folly of folly. Everything is folly or foolishness. But Rashi says, there are seven hevels here. Havel havolim. Havel is one. Havolim is a plural, adds two. Havel havolim is one and another two. It's six. Hakoil hevel is seven. What are the seven hevels? So Rashi says, it's keneged masiburatius. The seven days of Masiburatius are Hevel. What does that mean? How could you say that the Hashem's Zabriya is Hevel? It's folly? It's foolishness? So I don't translate it that way. Havel Havolim means it's a, the world is an illusion. 
It's a grand illusion. If you think, I mean, the, the Kahelis is talking about turning away from the Torah and turning away from Hashem and chasing after the world as if it were independent of God. That you, that, you, know, you forget about the Torah. Not saying you do Averis, but you don't focus on the Torah. You don't, not too busy with God. You focus on you want to travel and see the world. You want to have a comfortable life. All these things. It's an illusion. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. It doesn't. Independent of God, the world has no has no existence. The whole world exists in God's mind. Or if you don't like that, it exists with, with shamans that hold it up. I'm not sure exactly how that works. But independent of God, the world has no existence. It's all an illusion. That's what he's saying. The world, not that Hashem created the world and is a world. That world doesn't have existence. Only through Hashem it doesn't have any other existence. Rashi says, Bracious Borelikim. Hashem created the world. The question is, what does Hashem do? How does he control the world? The Rambam says in the beginning of the fifth parak of Ovis that Hashem doesn't do Nisim. He doesn't he doesn't override nature, only very rarely, you know. But otherwise he made a, a knai with the with the yam. That it should split. What does that mean? I mean, the Yam has no Das. It means that he built into nature that the Yam will split at that time. He built it in. If he doesn't, then, then it's, not, it's not a Ness. He's not overriding nature. Hashem leaves things in nature. He doesn't want to override nature. So how does he control the world? So Rashi says like this. Rashi is more like him. Rashi says, Layoma Bora Hashem. It doesn't say Hashem, it says Bora Lekim. Which is uh, Hashem is God and Elkim is the Lord. Shebetchila Olav Machshavel of Arais Admidus Aden. The first thought he had was to create the world with Midus Aden, with strict justice. But then he saw that the world, the world cannot survive if it's being, if it's with Midus Aden. Higdim Midas Rachmem, who should tofel Midas Aden. He brought forward Midas Rachmem and he combined it with Midas Aden. That's why it says, Yoim Asois Hashem Elokim. Hashem Elokim are combined. It's a combination. Hashem is Midas Rachmem, it's mercy. Elokim is Midas Aden, strict justice. The world cannot survive on Midas Rachmem, therefore he combined it. So what, how can you say, first of all, that he first had this idea and he saw it didn't work, so that he, that he changed it? I mean, it's, you can't say that. All of Machshova the Kreid Midas Aden. So it means what? There would be no Bittas Rachmem. How could that be? There would be no Tshuva, there would be no Yom Kippur, there would be no Tefillah, there would be no Rachmem. How could it be? I mean, the whole world, you know, there'd be no Rachamim. Everything would meet us at then. How could that be? So I think what Rashi is saying is this. That meet us at then, the definition of meet us at then is perfect cause and effect. Meet us that means you do this, this happens. Do this, that happens. That's meet us at then. If you get into your car and you stick the key into the, well, I don't know, when there were keys. You stick the keys into the ignition and you turn it, and the car goes on, that's a Midas Adin car. The cause, the effect. If sometimes it goes on and sometimes not, that is a Midas Rachmem car. Rachmem doesn't always have to be. It's not for sure that this cause will lead to that effect. There is Rachmem. At this point, we're not talking about people. And what does he mean, Higdim? He brought it forward. What does that mean? He brought it forward from where? So at this point, we're not talking about people. We're talking about the creation of the physical world. Of course, people will have Rachman. Of course. But we're talking about the creation of the physical world. If the physical world only operated Amidas Adin, that every cause inevitably led to an effect, 
in the physical world, then the world would not survive. Why? Because if a person got sick, so Mila Sadin says, you get sick, you die. And the world would not survive. So he brought forward Midas Rachman. Midas Rachman was meant to be for people, to give them Rachman, that they shouldn't get punished for the Averis. Rachman. He brought forward the Midas Rachman from, from people, and he combined it with Midas Adin in the actual creation of the world, that there was not perfect cause and effect. In science, this is called Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Some, there's, not, it, there's, no, there's no guarantee that a cause will result in a certain effect. Sometimes there are variables. It won't. So by, and that is the Midas Arachmim. Taking the Midas Arachmim and combining it with the Midas Adin, that the Midas Adin is not inevitable, that it could be not, that is where the Rabban Shalom controls the world. In that uncertainty principle. Without making a nest. There's a randomness. It could be like this, it could be like that. So Hashem manipulates the randomness, and that's how He controls the world. First of all, that allows um, Kaviochel that there would be Midas Rachm with people, because it doesn't have to be. If you get sick, you don't have to die. Maybe not. And, and anything the Russian wants to do in the world without doing an actual miracle, he does it with manipulating the uncertainty principle. So is that where tefillah could, could intervene? Tefillah is rachamim. Tefillah is rachamim. But since, since, there's no, since the world is not inevitable, what happens in the world is not inevitable, sometimes it goes this way, sometimes it goes that way. It's not guaranteed that that's going to happen. Therefore, if you daven, Hashem is merachim on you, then if, if a person gets cancer, if he has to die, he has to die. You want it to make a miracle? Not everybody deserves that Hashem should override, override nature and make a miracle and cure you. No. But since there is an uncertainty principle, and sometimes you could have spontaneous remissions, then that is where Hashem will manipulate the world without making a miracle. Miracles, according to Rambam, are not what, what, what Hashem wants to do. This Pesach says, what does this mean, Bereshit's world again? So he says that Chazal say, B'shvil HaToyra Shnei Reishis, B'shvil Yisrael Shnei Reishis, the Medjah says, because of Bikurim, if you want to say Pasha Pshat, say Bereshit's Briyas Shemayim V'Oretz, in the beginning of the creation, that's what Bereshit means, in the, when the creation began, this is what happened. Now, it's well known that Rashi explains the Psukim Apidar Chapshat. He says Pshuta Shemikra. He really sometimes he'll bring a Medrash afterwards. He'll say Rabbi Seinu Amru, Medrash Agoda. He'll say something like that. But his main goal is to explain Al Dar Chapshat. Here, it's reversed. He starts out telling you a drush, and then he says, if you want to learn out the Rapshat, then it means in the beginning of the creation. Why? The last pasuk in the Torah, it says, I call a Yad Chazoka, also Ene Kol Yisrael. What does call a Yad Chazoka mean? Pashapshat means uh, that, uh, you know, it's a spiritual thing, you know personal, courageous, strong. But Rashi says, Yad HaZoka means that he was able to lift up the luchas that were very, very heavy rocks and he was able to lift them up. So Rashi explains it, Apidar HaDrush. Why does he explain Apidar HaDrush? He doesn't even say, I mean, this is probably a medrash. It's not the Pashtav Shat Nupasik. Rashi explains al Dar Chadrush. Avir also, the first Pasuk in the Torah, Rashi also explains al Dar Chadrush. So I was thinking that we know that the Torah could be um, interpreted with Pardas. And Pshat, Remesh, Drush, and Said. There are four ways. You could say Pashat Pshat, you could do a Drush, you could do 
Ramazim, Kabbalistic things. Soyd is like very Kabbalistic. These are the four ways. Rashi chose to do it Alpidar Chapshat. But he wants you to know that just because he did it Alpidar Chapshat doesn't mean that Drush is not as true as Pshat. All of, four, all of these four ways, all of them are truth. Rashi chose to use their Chapshat. But Rush is equally true. It's a different way of interpreting the Pasuk. The Pasuk tolerates all these, all these ways. They're all there. So the first Pasuk in the Torah and the last Pasuk in the Torah, Rashi explains Alpi Derech Adrush. And then he says at the end, if you want to know what it means, Alpi Derech Hapshat, then I'll tell you it means at the beginning of creation. But he's trying to tell you that he is choosing to go with the not because this is true and the others are not true, but because that's what he's doing. Other Mepharshim will go different Rachim. The Midrashim, other Mepharshim will choose different paths. All of them are true. Thank you very much. I hope to see you next week. I will do Nayach.